Hello everyone and welcome to week two. This week we're looking at prioritising the needs of diverse learners. It is a truth that when you go out to schools in placements and later as a teacher, your classes will be places of diversity. No two students will be the same. They'll come from a range of very diverse backgrounds. They could be a language background, a cultural background, differences in, in aptitude, ability, interests, differences in, in um, racial background, differences in sexuality and sexual orientation, differences in terms of being abled or disabled. So many differences that you'll find in your classroom, so much diversity. And yet, we as professionals need to engage with this and see it positively. Because I, for one, believe in strength-based practices, practices where you are looking for the best of a student you teach, not the worst. You're looking for the potential, not the problem. And I like to echo this sentiment that people are not the problem. It's our attitudes, it's our systems, it's our approaches. People are not the problem. So uh, if we bring a positive attitude, an attitude of strength, an attitude that um, we, they, every student can learn and has the right to learn, then I think we're bringing the right attitude to the, these very diverse classrooms that in fact have always existed. I hope by now that you've actually done the online activities for week one. They're quite comprehensive and they cover a range of, of key issues. Um, I'd go from your personal take on these education priorities right through to the global priorities in education. And I've asked you to reflect on what you've experienced of priorities in your own school placement or, or your school experience when you were at school. What subject areas in particular um, focus on some of these priorities? Priorities such as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures or sustainability. Or, or on diversity? What was the focus in, in your school? Reflect critically about that. The other thing is the national agendas here. There's a strong national agenda about Indigenous education and there's also um, a need to consider the, our understanding and the needs of students who are non-Indigenous to understand Indigenous issues. So um, how will you bring these range of different uh, educational priorities that are articulated in the Australian curriculum, how will you bring them to your discipline area? No matter if, you, if it's physics or chemistry or, or if it's broader science or mathematics or history or English or, or languages, geography, um, the arts, whatever the area may be, and I've probably missed a few people there, um, wherever the area may be, um, you're called on to actually bring these, these, these uh, educational priorities into your teaching and into the learning that students will experience. There are also, there are also global priorities in education. And uh, I asked you to go through and look at some of these barriers to education around the world. And of course, one of the core values one of the core barriers, you should say, and perhaps our core value, is that every child has a right to an education. And in some countries, that's not exactly um, happening. And even within Australia, in some of the indigenous communities, this is not happening to the extent that it might. I also asked you to look at the UNESCO set of priorities and, and think about um, which ones are actually quite urgent. And how do they um, parallel some of the thinking that's in the Australian curriculum? So this is really at the heart of what this whole unit is about, really thinking in this area. Archbishop Desmond Tutu um, won the Nobel Prize for Peace and was one of the, one of the primary people who drove, um, drove the change to apartheid in South Africa. He was instrumental and brave in, in driving that move. 
And he recognised, though, that in, in bringing change to South Africa, that everybody needed to be accounted for, everybody in that community. And this is what he said, what he wrote. We inhabit a universe that is characterised by diversity. He recognised that and recognised that um, in healing the South African nation and moving beyond apartheid, that, rec that recognition of diversity was essential. Uh, it's a great lesson. It's a great uh, inspiration for all of us who teach to, uh, to encounter diversity and, and encounter it in a positive way, a forward-looking way, a strength-based way. So what I'm asking you to do now is actually write your own definition of diversity in one sentence. I'm going to pause a minute, get you to write it, and then um, think about what you've actually written. So what is diversity to you? What does it include? Who does it include is the most important thing. And, and when you get to write a definition of diversity, you get to see that it is quite a comprehensive concept to actually define. So it might include, for instance, might include um, those of different faith backgrounds, different um, different uh, um, ab ab abilities, different um, people with um, diverse backgrounds culturally in language, people who uh, are of different body shapes. The list goes on and on and on. And all these people are represented in the classrooms that you teach, that you have to deal with, that you have to um, respect, and that you have to develop um, teaching and learning that uh, respects this notion of diversity. I'm unable to show you this, um, this YouTube clip on this um, presentation today, but please go into the slides that are on Moodle and watch it for yourself. It's a very, very interesting YouTube clip. Diversity Matters in Education. This is the YouTube clip. And I want you to watch it through very thoroughly after you've, you've listened to, to um, my online lecture today. And think about, think about after you, think about what is missing from this YouTube clip. So it presents a picture of diversity. But what's actually missing there? And going back to your definition of diversity, in the, looking at that definition and looking at the YouTube clip, what doesn't the YouTube clip include? All right, so um, if you were in class, in a live face-to-face -face class, you would have got to do a workshop activity. And this is the workshop activity. What diverse learners do you think you'll encounter in the classroom? Well, it, it, it's, uh, it'll be good for you to make a list of all these diverse learners. So you, it really brings it into your consciousness about the sorts of diverse learners that you will encounter. Um, I was going to get you to do group work and write up these diverse learners, but this is something you can do as an activity. What diverse learners do you think you will encounter in the classroom? And, and, and uh, map out or list out uh, the, the types of diverse learners. And then pick one of those diverse learner groups and what do you think their particular needs are? What do they need above all else? Now, for example, if, if for example, your diverse learner is someone from um, an EAL background, English is another language background, um, and, and their, their English skills are still developing, what do you think they particularly need to assist their, their, their learning in your discipline area? Remembering, of course, that their, their learning of English, 
is not the responsibility only of the English teacher or the EAL specialist. It's also your responsibility as a classroom teacher. And, you know, if you're a maths teacher, it is your responsibility to uh, assist them, to develop them, to enable them in their English. So um, you're going to share all, uh, all these activities, but you might like to share it in your forum. So um, share what you think in your forum about this idea of diversity. So just looking at um, some of the statistics around uh, students with a disability and the category of disability is only one group of, uh, of diverse students that you'll have in your classroom, but it's a very important one and one that's often quite fraught. So children with disability, well, look at the statistics here. 9.9% .9 are in special schools. They are schools designed specifically for students with a disability, particularly those uh, on the more severe end. But 24.3% have special classes within mainstream schools and 65.9% are in regular classrooms in mainstream schools. So, and of that, nearly 40% have profound or severe limitation and, and they'll often have an aid with them. Now, I remember working with many, many aides when I was a teacher and having students who are often quite profoundly disabled in the classroom with me. And what, what, what did I have to do to work with that student to make their learning enjoyable and engaging, to make it meaningful for, for them, and to also work with their aid to assist the aid to assist them. So this is all part of our work. And, and of course, mainstreaming of students with this disability has sort of become the practice. So, and one in 10 boys in school have a disability compared to one in 16 girls. 60% 60 of children with disability at school had an intellectual disability. So finding ways of communicating um, articulating tasks for students and making it understandable and accessible for students with an intellectual disability. This is part of the challenge of your role in, in school. And just to have a half of all children with disability at school receives additional assistance. Um, and so they might have special tuition, special access to counsellors or a disability support worker, an aide that's often in the room with them and accounting for the, the aides in the room and working with them as part of your professional work. And you can see, if you go to this website here, you can see uh, a lot more material about this and where these statistics came from. So there are a whole range of well-known people who have a serious illness or a disability that could have held them back, uh, and yet they became very successful. One is Stephen Hawking, who you all know about, who, who died a, a couple of years ago. He's seen as one of the greatest phys physicists and greatest thinkers of all time and has changed the way we actually see the universe. Um, you notice his, his uh, condition here um, that severely affected his movement uh, to the point where um, only, only very limited parts of his body can move. And, and of course, he had a purpose-built wheelchair and communication system built for him that was actually quite fabulous. And he was able to do his work and contribute uh, his wonderful mind to the world despite his physical um, disability. So here is, is one where we're looking at strengths. Uh, his strength was his wonderful mind and his, uh, his, his powerful thinking, his forward-looking thinking. His ability to write and articulate science ideas. So he um, is an example of, of, of um, where you focus on strength, even despite a disability, you're able to achieve great things. Some of you mightn't like this person, but <laughs> Kim Kardashian um, has psoriasis. Um, well, she has the resources to, um, to overcome this condition or to, to, to keep it under control. Psoriasis has no cure, but she's able to control it through medication and able to be a successful reality TV star and model. Um, so other people, Bruce Willis is, has a speech disorder and only, that only becomes apparent when he's not acting. 
Hugo Weaving uh, has epilepsy and quite severely, again, not apparent when he's acting, but um, uh, despite this terrible limitation, he has had a very successful acting career. And of course, um, Beethoven, the great composer, um, was profoundly deaf and, and couldn't hear his work, though he could feel the work, so he could sense the vibrations in the work. And, and, and in a way, he, he, he was hearing through uh, his sense touch. And of course, Steady Eddie, uh, he's a comedian, um, uh, some of you may know. Uh, he uh, had cerebral palsy quite severely. He came out to a school I worked in uh, one year to speak to a group of year 11s. And he was extremely funny and communicated so well with them. Uh, and an interesting thing he told, um, his, some of his uh, things he said were quite sexual and he had sexual jokes which we were very uncomfortable with as staff and think, oh, what right has he got to say these things to our Year 11 students? And then I stopped myself and I said, and this is a truth, every person has is a sexual being, including those with disabilities. Every person is a sexual being and has a right to express this. I think we were all shocked that someone with disability was sexual or, or made sexual references. And yet we should stop and say, um, people with disability are human beings with the same feelings, with the, with the same thoughts. So um, this was sort of a, a lesson in thinking about the nature of the disability and how we see it through such a deficit model. And of course, um, uh, Adam Hills, who is a famous Australian host in Britain. Uh, so being um, having a disability, and if that's your diversity, uh, that, that uh, need not necessarily hold you back. So un under the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of a Person with Disability, every person has a right to learn. Every person has a right to access um, facilities, to access services, to access education. We have the Disability Standards for Education in Australia, which, which really does articulate these rights uh, and, and that there are reasonable adjustments which ensure students with a disability are provided with opportunities to participate in education. We cannot stop people participating in education. It is their right. Um, so. Uh, when you're working in a classroom with someone who's disabled, it is their right to uh, have access to the, every opportunity they can get. And of course, this is enshrined in the Australian curriculum, which assumes every student can learn and has high, high expectations of every student, including those from diverse backgrounds, including those with disabilities. The Victorian um, curriculum expresses a similar sentiment. So uh, people from a variety of linguistic, indigenous backgrounds, different learning styles, um, different, di different sexualities, gender, economic background. This is one that's really very important. People from uh, low socioeconomic backgrounds uh, uh, need support to learn and to uh, have these opportunities. So our language, the way we treat people, the way we work needs to be inclusive of all people who come uh, un under our, our leadership as teachers. And we should be aspirational for these students. This is certainly encapsulated in the Australian curriculum and in the Victorian curriculum. And is also encapsulated in the Australian professional standards for teachers. You can see here that standard one says, no students and how they learn. And to differentiate teaching to meet the needs of students across a range of abilities and, and also strategies to support full participation of students with disability. So this is um, now across all the major policy documents and curriculum documents in Australia. It's not a matter uh, that you have, that you should do it, you have to do it. And you, and, but see this as a positive that we are, you are contributing as teachers to the lives of these students quite directly. And I've had so many 
positive experiences of students who I've taught who um, uh, whose lives have been changed. I don't see myself as anything special, but I am a visionary. I want to, I, as a teacher, I wanted to make a difference in the lives of the students I taught. It's something I always believed in. And, and so in this, in this diversity, you can find opportunities to really grow students and grow yourself through that. So this uh, one area is differentiation. And you notice here that dif what differ if differentiation is and is not. It's student-centered primarily. It's not about a learning program. It's about teaching a student and where that student is at. That's really what differentiation is about. Um, it, and, and so uh, it's about student need. It's about recognising um, that every student is uh, different and that difference is valued. This is really the heart of differentiation and designing learning in consultation with that student so that student uh, enjoys their learning. So you're planning with the student. There's no such thing as the average child. Uh, there are children in your classroom from so many different backgrounds with so many different abilities, interests, so many different things that, that make them so diverse. And that's exciting. And that's an opportunity to really um, ch change things up in your classroom and meet the needs of the students that you teach. And you can see some, some links there to a couple of um, articles about differentiation which are really quite interesting. So um, differentiation is one of the core practices that all Australian teachers need to en engage with. It's personalised learning, um, but personalised not in the sense of curriculum, but personalised for a student. It's listening to the student, it's seeing their need, and then it's translating uh, uh, content and, uh, it, uh, to meet the needs of that student. So please look at some of those links there that uh, give you some examples of, of how differentiation can be done. And of course, one of the final concepts I want to engage with you is about the idea of integration and inclusion. Integration and inclusion are not the same things. Um, and, and have a look at the diagrams there. Exclusion means there is a, a, a group that's privileged and then other people outside that group that are not. Uh, segregation is complete separation. Integration is bringing that group of people who are different into, but still not fully part of the whole, the whole community. And inclusion, which is where we need to be, is really about bringing everyone who's different to be fully and, and totally um, part of all we do uh, in, in education. Um, so the practice, you notice there, the inclusion is the practice of educating all students, including those with disabilities in mainstream schools and classrooms for the entire school day, not separating them off, not finding different places for them to be, uh, perhaps only having special classes that are based on need. Uh, so this is, these are concepts that are really very core to how you plan curriculum, how you plan student activities, how you work with individual students. And of course, inclusion. There's, let's, let me just say this. This is not, I don't want to over, de over, uh, over idealize here. There are issues. There are difficulties. And anyone that's worked in the space knows what these difficulties are. So inclusion is a complex process, often raising more questions than answers. So, um, but we, we are ever full of hope for the students we teach, even despite difficulties even despite problems that we may encounter along the way and even reversals and things and, and, and uh, that may happen in our engagement with students who are, who, are, who are different, we still come from a position of hope and a position of looking for strength. And that really is the heart of inclusive education. So um, in this second workshop activity, you, uh, uh, you might like to look at and pick one yourself to have to have a look at uh, ADHD, autism, intellectual disability, hearing impaired, 
cultural and linguistic diversity, gifted and talented. And that's an area that is often missed. Those students who have particular giftings or, or, or abilities that are, that are, 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 are on the top end or, or, or of, of the spectrum. And often their needs are not met. So, you know, part of diversity is looking at those students who, who are specially gifted. And, and, of course, you might want to look at uh, what their needs are for these particular groups. Have a look at them. Pick one of these groups and, and have a look at their social, emotional needs, behavioral needs, academic needs. Um, and also, think about this. The having these people in the, in the class brings a benefit to the whole class. I think diversity is a wonderful thing that actually benefits everyone. Far from being a problem, it actually can bring great benefits. It makes us see things differently from different perspectives. It, bring, it makes us more empathetic and makes us um, uh, think about um, what a community really is. So um, these are some useful websites here. Have a look up, pick one, have a look up some of these groups and their, their particular needs and how you might approach some of these students as, as a teacher with an eye to being inclusive. So why is it important? Well, inclusive education, I want to pick out one thing here. You can read this material for yourself, but I want to pick out one thing that here um, that's really very, very important. This awareness and compassion uh, of, of all those, this ethical understanding. Because fundamentally, when we work inclusively, this is ethical work that we're doing. Every student deserves to respect, to have voice, and to have uh, access to a decent quality of education. And this is an ethical issue here. So think about that. Think about those four points about um, the, this personal social understanding of all students. And, and here's some particular tips. And one that I want to particularly stress here is being flexible, being adaptable, not being too rigid in the way you actually conceive uh, your, your, your content and your, and your discipline area, but being flexible, being open to what students need and what they'd like to do. So if there's any questions about assessment task one, uh, these will be dealt with in forums. Um, and and um, there is some changes in the wind about assessment task one, so please look on Moodle for those. All right, here's some resources, and thank you for listening today, and please participate in your forums with your tutor and with the students in your, your class. Thank you, everyone.